Hello and God bless you. I am Matt McIntosh with Vallejo Bible College and I want to welcome you to this edition of In the Classroom. We pray that you're walking strong in the Lord and continuing to grow in grace, which just happens to be the very subject we want to focus on today. We have a wonderful episode in store for you as we'll be examining the seven biblical virtues uh, to spiritual maturity. And this is definitely going to be something that you will want to hear as it benefits Christians of every age, experience, and maturity level. And it's our hope that this lesson will encourage all of us to examine ourselves against that which God mandates and discover what may be lacking in our Christian character that can get us closer to what God would have us to be. Amen. So let's have a word of prayer and then we'll begin. And Heavenly Father, we come before you now in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we thank you for this opportunity just to learn and to grow in grace and in the knowledge of you. Father, we ask you now to just anoint our minds, to gain understanding, and help us to be what you would have us to be in Christ. And we thank you, Father, for this. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. And amen. And amen. Praise the Lord. We're going to take our scripture reading today from 2 Peter chapter 1. This portion of the text is addressed to the New Testament church, extending to the present times we're currently living in. Peter opens this book by citing that God, according to his divine power, has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, and that through the exceeding great and precious promises of God, we might be partakers of the divine nature. Now, his subject matter turns here to a set of seven particular virtues that are outlined in a very specific and important order that will ultimately equip us to partake of such a divine nature that is now possible through Christ. So let's pick up now in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. And the Bible says this, And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. To begin we need to understand that these virtues are prioritized according to the Word of God for the very important reason of obtaining all of them. And as we will see, the commencing virtue is first necessary to achieve in order to come to the full realization of the subsequent virtue. We know this is true because the scriptures themselves teach us to add to the previous, which means the previous must first be acquired. This process is quite incredible. God knew exactly how each virtue would supplement the next in order for us to maximize them all. The more of these virtues that we obtain, the closer we move to the spiritual ideal that God desires us to possess. The earlier acquired virtues are of equal importance to those virtues which are later and may seem greater uh, for lack of better terminology, uh, as they almost build off of each other in order to blossom to their fullest extent. Now consider a building for an analogy of this. A building is greater than the bricks required to make it, yet the building does not exist without those bricks. All parts must be equally respected if the building is to be strongly constructed including the building process, which these virtues demonstrate. Let's look now to the biblical progression. Peter begins by instructing us to add to our faith. Now, this is important because faith is the foundation that these seven virtues must be built upon. Moreover, it is taken for granted that faith is had in possession, which signifies that this is addressed to believers. 
Because without saving faith in Jesus Christ, we are not children of God. And any attempt to try to achieve these virtues without Him would be in vain. So let's look now to number one. The first one that Peter starts with is virtue itself. Add to your faith virtue. Virtue in the original Greek means moral goodness and excellence, but not just any kind. It is that moral distinction which is patterned after God's standard that we are called to embrace. And only the Holy Spirit can guide us in this standard and is now free to do so seeing as we have received the Spirit when we believed. And it makes sense that this virtue is the first of these seven. The fact that we uphold God's standard regarding sin, regarding righteousness, after we get saved, as we are certainly supposed to do, is one of the most basic and elementary evidences of our salvation. And it's also proof of the Spirit's indwelling. Alongside the truth that the Spirit of God is able to empower us for anything that God wills, including the resistance to sin and the embracing of righteousness. So the first step is to simply be obedient to follow the moral character of God as the Spirit leads us. Until we learn this most basic rule of obedience, we cannot progress forward. Number two, it is this newly gained virtue that should lead us to seek the most fundamental thing that a Christian should seek, and that is knowledge. Add to your virtue knowledge. Now, whereas virtue is aided by the Spirit within us, knowledge must be sought, and sought first and foremost by the Word of God. That is what this virtue should center around knowing your Bible. Uh, virtue is defined as moral goodness and excellence, but knowledge is defined as moral wisdom and direction. So while virtue aims at the heart, knowledge aims at the mind. This is why knowledge is and must be the second step. It is by knowledge contained in the Word of God that our virtue is enhanced with instruction, direction, and purpose. God's Word is God's will explained. Okay? God's Word is God's will explained. Therefore, without the Word of God, we will never genuinely know the mind of God, nor the anchor it serves as to keep us immovable regarding that which is God's will. And what this world needs now more than ever is Christians who study their Bibles and seek to know the mind of God. And to give some indication as to how important this virtue is, according to Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, God's people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Number three, we then add to our knowledge temperance. Now, temperance may arguably be the most underrated virtue of all when you begin to understand how life-changing it can be when it is taken seriously. Temperance in the Greek is self-control, especially regarding continence and sensual desires. As a people called into holiness and sanctification, our carnal senses and inclinations must be brought into subjection. Since being born again does not remove these fleshly desires that war against the Spirit. Unfortunately, many people have tried to justify sins because of that. But virtue and knowledge alone negate any justifications for sins of any kind. The Word of God instructs how to overcome the flesh and cultivate our temperance. This is why knowledge is the forerunner of temperance. When we begin to understand that a lack of temperance is a wellspring for sin to flourish, it's no great wonder that temperance is prioritized as the third of these seven. 
Consider this, that practically every sin imaginable could be avoided by way of self-control. I mean, think about it. The three gates of sin, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life could all be restrained through this magnificent virtue of temperance. And that's a very big deal. Magnifying this virtue is the fact that we must yield ourselves unto God in order to achieve it, which teaches us to be dependent on Him. And you can read more about that in Romans chapter 6, verses 13 and 19. Temperance is self-control in all mediums, be it temper, attitude, eating habits, conversation, sexuality, and even thoughts. Even thoughts. There are no exclusions. Self-control is so much more important than many people realize when it comes to attaining relational fulfillment with God, a measure of which could not be calculated. And because temperance is also one of the nine fruits of the Spirit, which further validates its importance, every Christian has the capacity to operate in it. And now number four. The Bible says, add to temperance, patience. Herein is a perfect example of why the Spirit penned these virtues in their particular order and why you need the previous ones in order to truly possess the next to the fullest potential. You cannot master patience if you have no self-control or if you are ill-tempered. And as much as temperance is the major contributing factor to possessing patience, patience is the token of a good and godly temperance. Of these seven, Patience is number four, right in the middle between the first three and the last three. Patience, therefore, is at the heart of all of these virtues, and for very good reason. First, we need to remember that God is not on our schedule. We are on His. And for many people, if things aren't happening at the pace they want them to, they become upset or ill-tempered, because they have no patience. And because of this, many people try to get ahead of God by forcing the issue and they end up messing something up or doing something that may turn out to be sinful. This is clearly demonstrated by Abram and Sarah in Genesis chapter 15 and 16, when that after God had promised Abram a seed, they tried to hurry God's process and ended up birthing something that is still a thorn in the side to Israel, even to this very day. By maintaining godly integrity and allowing God to work things out His way, patience is manifested and the believer is perfected and made better and stronger. Ecclesiastes 3.11 assures us that God makes everything beautiful in His time. Patience here is defined as persevering, waiting, and remaining loyal to God, no matter the tribulation or suffering. And folks, tribulation and suffering and waiting, all of these are certainties in life, aren't they? But patience is the key to mastering them and to remaining faithful to God through the process. To genuinely get where God would have us to be is going to require patience without question. And patience gives us the power to persevere. And perseverance is an evidence of our salvation. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're going to take a quick break now, but don't go anywhere. We are coming right back. I want a better life.
Thank you, Jesus. Welcome back. We are currently discussing the seven biblical virtues to spiritual maturity. And we are now coming to number five. The Bible says, add to patience godliness. Ironically, it isn't until number five of seven that godliness comes into view. Based on the priority of this list, it's not until Christians acquire virtue, knowledge, temperance, and patience, that they can justifiably be classified as godly, at least in the experimental sense. And this is a very sobering truth and should also be very humbling for us all. For instance, far too many Christians fall short of godliness for failing to possess just the second of these seven, knowledge, because maybe they aren't studying their Bibles as the Word of God instructs and know practically nothing about what the scriptures teach. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God. Not approved unto man, approved unto God. And I'm not saying this to try to shame anybody, only in hopes of stirring our hearts to do better. Because if godliness is to be valued and sought after as it should be, then we must respect its criteria. That godliness is number five is perfectly reasonable when it is rightly divided. Um, being born again does not necessarily make a person godly or spiritual. Positionally, yes, but experimentally, no. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, Paul plainly asserts and demonstrates that there are both spiritual and carnal Christians. The Greek word is defined as piety, reverence, and respect 
and it is derived from the Greek word meaning devout and dutiful. It's important to recognize that all these meanings are aimed at our conduct toward God. In the simplest of definitions based on these meanings, godliness is the obtaining of a higher standard of godly conviction and conduct pertaining to the things of God. So in the context of the meaning, to be godly is this, to forsake the world and worldliness, to not be partakers of things that would bring confusion, stumbling blocks or offense to the gospel of Christ, to live a sanctified and a holy life, to be devoted to God in prayer and study and conforming as close to the scriptures as possible, to hold God first in your life above all others and all things, to be immovable in your convictions and not allow yourself to be influenced by the world, but rather try to be the influence unto them. Uh, that is the godliness that's being called out here in this scripture. You know you're getting close to godliness when you stand out from among everyone else and can noticeably be distinguished by them as a Christian because you clearly are not doing what the rest of the world is doing. And your manner of conversation and attitude is Christ-like. You don't talk or act like everybody else. You don't go to certain places or partake of certain types of entertainment. Your habits are that of things righteous. And you aren't chained to any vices that degrade your Christian character or your physical body. You are godly when you show yourself a spiritual Christian and not a carnal one. Now let's look to number six. Add to godliness brotherly kindness. Brotherly kindness is defined as fraternal affection and the love of the brethren. Now at first glance, it seems strange that brotherly kindness is further on the list than godliness. But understanding the true nature of these virtues really explains how this can be and why it's biblically sound. It's easy to comprehend why we treat God with reverence and respect. But unfortunately, that doesn't mean we treat others that way, especially the brethren, the church, who this pertains to. And it is of a certainty that not all Christians do. Um, for the very same reason that Paul discusses in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, referenced just prior. That text pertains to divisions and sectarianism, which the Word of God is dogmatically against. Of all the gross wrongdoings that the church at Corinth was guilty of, the very first rebuke that Paul gave them was regarding their divisions. And that speaks volumes. You can read about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 13. Divisions can form for any number of reasons, even within individual churches, and they usually only reap negative results. It is a natural human inclination to form judgments against other Christians who don't do everything exactly the way we may do, or who are not in our clique or our denomination. Sadly, it's often the case for some that holiness has come to mean holier than thou. Before long, a contempt or a division has developed for no other reason than trivial differences, and brotherly love is destroyed. Even the most genuine, sincere Christians can fall prey to this prideful trap. Even the disciples reasoned among themselves which of them should be the greatest. That is nothing more than sinful pride. Consider their thinking in Luke chapter 9, verses 49 and 50. The Bible says, And John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him, because he followeth not with us. And Jesus said unto him, Forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. According to the scriptures, 
One of the main proofs of genuine children of God is their love of the brethren. The Bible makes no distinctions. It refers to all of the church, not just some. 1 John 3 verse 10 says, In this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. 1 John chapter 3, verse 14 says, We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Now this lack of brotherly love is something that unfortunately continues to maintain its place in the church world today. And sectarianism and divisions are the main reasons why. Many Christians have been drilled into believing that their denomination are the only ones who are saved, the only ones who are living right, etc. Most times resulting in the vile outcome of contempt for fellow Christians rather than brotherly love. The reason this issue is so important is because unity produces and divisions destroy. The church can never grow to its fullest potential if it is divided and souls will ultimately be lost. Also, love for the brethren, or lack thereof for that matter, is actually a measuring rod to the true nature of one's heart towards God himself. We find this in 1 John chapter 4, verses 20 and 21. The Bible says, If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God loveth his brother also. And herein is why brotherly kindness must be added to godliness, for it takes true godliness to conform to this most important of virtues. Just love people, all people, especially those who call themselves Christians. If they are born again and have put their faith in Christ alone for their salvation, then they are of the household of God and should be treated and loved as family, regardless of what the name is over the door of their church. Amen. And finally, the seventh and final step. The Bible says, add to brotherly kindness, charity. Now, the Greek word here means love. But the meaning is far more significant. This love stated here is agape love. Agape love. It is the deepest and godliest love of all. One of the greatest distinctions of agape love is that it is completely selfless and always puts the interests of others first. It's in, it is in this distinction that the love of God and the example of Christ are the most demonstrated. When the Bible says in 1 John 4, 8 that God is love, agape is the love it is referring to. So it's no great wonder that in order for such a love to actively thrive in the Christian, these previous six virtues need to be present. When we genuinely love the brethren, all the brethren. It is a convincing proof that we have within us the capacity to love such as this. When we lack virtue and knowledge and temperance, when we lack patience and godliness and brotherly kindness, it stands to reason that we would also lack agape love. To possess this virtue is to love the unlovable, uh, to continue to love others, when you were hated and persecuted by them. Agape love crescendos the maturity of the Christian because it conforms us as close to God as we can possibly get for a human being and equips us to handle any situation that comes our way. This is why the Bible boldly declares in 1 Corinthians 13, 8, charity, which is agape love, never fails. So 
this final virtue that the Word of God places it, even above the pillars of faith and hope, that's how great this virtue is. Uh, seven is God's perfect and complete number. And the attaining of this seventh virtue is necessary to make us a complete Christian, properly conformed to the image of Christ. It doesn't mean that we have achieved flawlessness. No, far from it. But we have certainly attained that which is necessary for proper Christian living that is approved of God and pleasing unto Him. So in closing, here is the result of adding these seven virtues to your faith. These are the subsequent verses of our subject matter, and I'm going to let them speak for themselves to close the episode. This is 2 Peter chapter 1. This is verses 8 through 11. The Bible says this, For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, we hope you've enjoyed this edition of In the Classroom, and we thank you so very much for watching. You can view this episode and others on our YouTube channel. God bless you.